This is our wrap-up Sunday for the teaching on the spiritual gifts. It's been a great series, super practical, super um, applicable to our lives. And if you've missed any of them, I would really encourage you to go online, super easy to find, and get up to track on those. They kind of build on one another, so it's good to have an idea where we started. And then today, as I said, this is the wrap-up. Well, we're going to do a quick overview this morning of the main points that we've learned from this series. Number one. Spiritual gifts are given to all believers at their time of salvation. So if you're a follower of Christ, you have gifts that have been deposited in you, even if you don't feel like you did, even if you don't feel like you have, they're in you. Some of you may say, you know what? I think I was in the bathroom when they were passing out gifts. I missed it. I missed the lineup. And now I'm, now I'm out of it completely. No, there's gifts in you. Number two, the Apostle Paul says that we should earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And that's been part of the plan of the staff, just to encourage you to say, go after these gifts. God gave them to the body for a purpose, and we get to run after them, and he would want us to do that. Number three, you can grow your spiritual gifts. Now, we all know it's awesome we can go to the gym and we can grow our muscles, but you can grow your spiritual gifts. And we're going to talk of a couple of ways that we can do that today. Number four, your gifts are to be exercised and used in love. That's always been the purpose of them. The gifts are also given to build up the body of Christ. They're not for yours only, for for, um, your own purposes, to um, position yourself or exalt yourself. They are given, God has given them to build up the body of Christ. And number six, and one of my favorites, you and your gift are a gift to this house. And we want you to know that. Pastor Ben says that over and over again. You and your gift are a gift to this house. Well, as we bring this series to a close, I'm going to be sharing on the spiritual gift of encouragement this morning. Now, you may wonder, why a deep dive, an entire message on this particular gift? And that's a fair question, because as we've gone through this series, we've read the list of gifts over and over, but we haven't given each gift its own message. So why does this gift get a whole sermon all of in all of its own? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons we're highlighting the gift this morning. First of all, the truth is that there isn't one of us here this morning that doesn't need this gift in our lives, at least at some point. Now, some of you may be sitting here and saying, you know what, I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm doing good. I don't really feel a need for it. Well, I will tell you that I have lived long enough to know that at some point, you're going to need a gift of encouragement, and you're going to hope someone stands up and speaks it over you. And that's a good thing. That's what the body is all about. We were never meant to run this race alone. Secondly, we're highlighting this gift today because I think this is an easy gift to undervalue. Now, I don't know if you've ever done a spiritual gift inventory. There's all kinds of them online. We actually have them here at FA if you want to go through those. They're a super valuable tool. But what I found is that sometimes when people go through them, if they end up with their, or they get, they're given a gift of encouragement, they're like, and you inquire of them, and you say, "What what gift did you get? Or what does the inquiry say, maybe how God's gifted you? They say, oh, I got the gift of encouragement. I just, I just got, I only got the gift of encouragement. And it can make people feel like they want to go through a drive through window and supersize their spiritual gift because I only got the gift of encouragement and I would really like to give up miracles or a prophetic gift because I was hoping for something with a little more substance than just encouragement. We fail, I've seen it over and over again, we fail to understand the weightiness of this gift. I'm going to propose to you that this gift exercised in the way God intended it can change people's lives. I'll go so far as to say this gift can save people's lives, not just change people's lives, but save people's lives. And it's quite possible there are people here this morning that can testify when you were down and out, when you thought there was no way through. When all hope is gone, someone spoke a word of encouragement over you, and that changed 
and in everything. Anyone here this morning testify to that? Yep. I needed a word of encouragement, and somebody stepped up, spoke it over my life. That would be me as well. I could raise my hand for that this morning. Well, if you've been outside at all in the last few weeks, you'll know this is a season when the Canadian geese are migrating. It's fascinating to watch as they fly in that V formation. And uh, they say that um, most of us would be, especially as Canadians, familiar with that very distinctive honking. Experts say that their honking serves several purposes, but primarily it's it's to encourage the geese to stay in formation and to not give up as they fly. Well, two weeks ago, our kids were away on vacation, and we had the joy of spending the entire week with our grandkids, so we moved right into their house. And on one of those afternoons, we had taken the kids to the park. It was by the water, and the geese that, that day were super, super noisy. And, and I remembered as I was sitting there listening to them, I remember that a couple of years earlier, we had talked to the grandkids, and we had told the grandkids why geese honk and how important it is that we do that for one another. Well, Adley, who is eight, she ran by me, and I called her over, and I said, Adley, do you remember the conversation we had a couple years ago about why geese honk? Do you remember what what I told you? And she said, yes, Nanny, I remember you told us that geese honk to encourage one another. And I said, that's right. Good, good memory. And then Garrett ran by. Garrett is five. And he ran by and I grabbed him as he ran by and I pulled him in close. And I said, Garrett, now I know it was a long time ago, but do you remember the conversation that we had and I told you why geese honk as they fly? And he said, yes, Nanny, I remember. And without a millisecond of hesitation, I said, why is that, Garrett? And he said, Nanny, geese honk to annoy one another. (laughs) So in light of Garrett's comment, I thought it best today that we turn to scripture and see what it has to say about encouragement, just so there's no confusion and we're all on the same page. We find this spiritual gift listed in Romans 12, Romans 12, 8 says, if, this, if your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. The NIV says, if your gift is to encourage, then give encouragement. Another version says, if your gift is encouragement, then devote yourself to giving encouragement. Now, there are some things that the Apostle Paul wrote, and when I read them, I think, oh, man, I need to be a Bible scholar and fluent in Greek to even try and begin to understand what he's saying, but not here. He says it loud and clear. If your spiritual gift is encouragement, then encourage. Now, to Garrett's point, the message version of that verse says, if you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. Now, don't look anywhere. Don't look sideways. Just keep looking at me. (laughs) And I have to wonder if that's not what happened to Garrett. Someone, not me, someone was trying to encourage him and they got a little bossy. And that was annoying for Garrett. It's hard to know what's going on in the mind of a five-year-old. But I will tell you, it's good advice for all of us. If you think you might have the gift of encouragement, just make sure you don't get bossy with it. The word encourage means to come alongside. It's actually to pour courage in for someone who's lacking it. It's this beautiful picture of the grace of God being poured into someone's life. Isn't that beautiful? Just think about that for a minute. It's a picture of the grace of God being poured into someone else's life. And folks, you and I get to do that for one another. You and I get to do that for one another. It's giving hope where there is no hope. It's hearing the heart of God for people and then speaking that over them. It's an exceedingly important gift and it can be used privately or publicly. The ESV in its translation uses the word exhortation instead of encouragement. And the word exhort simply means to strongly encourage them 
or move someone forward, to urge them. When I read that, there was a verse in Hebrews that came to mind, and it's Hebrews 10, 24. This is what it says. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards loving good deeds. The Greek word behind the word spur is to provoke or to stir up. Well, it's hard, especially living in Alberta, to not immediately see and have a picture in your mind of someone sitting on a horse as he uses his spur on the back of his boot to get that horse moving. So the gift of encouragement can be a word of comfort or courage, but it can also be used to exhort as with a spur to move someone forward in their faith or their calling. Having said that, we all know that discouragement is not an uncommon human experience. At times, recognizing that there is meaning in the challenges that we're walking through can seem next to impossible. We may want to give up. And when we feel like giving up, we can be tempted to make decisions that will change our lives forever and change the lives of those we love We are exceedingly vulnerable right then when we're despairing and we're discouraged. So what do we do then if we find ourselves in that place? What do we do if we don't have someone with the gift of encouragement living beside us or we actually are all alone or we feel like we're all alone? Well, 1 Samuel 30 verse 6 tells us, It says, when David was greatly distressed and fearing for his life, he chose to encourage himself in the Lord. I wish there was a little QR code that we could click on and read a little devotional on the five things David did to encourage himself, but that's not how it works. And we're left to wonder, how did he encourage himself? There's no way to really know, but if I had to guess... I think he would likely rehearse all of the times that God had shown himself faithful to him as he looked back over his life. And I think he might have lifted his hands in worship to the Lord of heaven's armies. And I have no doubt that he went back to the very words that he had penned to remind himself of God's promises and of his sufficiency. I wonder if he quoted Psalm 62. My soul, it waits quietly for you, O God, for my expectation is from you. You alone are my rock. You are my defense. I will not be moved. We don't know how David strengthened and encouraged himself. The only thing we know for sure is that he chose to do it in a time of great despair. And without question, friends, there will be times in our lives, and maybe there have been already, where you have needed to do the same. And this is a discipline that we need to learn. How do we strengthen? How do we encourage ourselves in the Lord? Here's the beauty of encouragement. Whether we're speaking it over ourselves or someone is speaking over it, us, it over us, encouragement gives us the will to carry on. When you want to give up, when you wonder if it's worth it, someone speaks encouragement over you and it gives you the will to carry on. It gives you a glimpse of the bigger picture because when life is hard and we are despairing or discouraged, we can be focused only what's in front of us. And encouragement helps us to see there's a bigger picture here. God is doing things behind the scene that you're not aware of right now. This gift of encouragement, it's the ability to uplift, inspire others through words and actions and genuine presence. It's putting your phones away and really looking at someone when you're talking to them. Genuine presence is an encouragement, especially in the world that we live in right now, especially. Those with this gift have a knack of recognizing potential in other people and then calling it out of them. It's a beautiful gift. The gift says that encouragement is necessary to our walk of faith. 
1 Thessalonians 5.14 in the New Living Translation says, brothers and sisters, encourage those that are timid. Take tender care of those that are weak. The ESV says, encourage those are, who are faint-hearted. Do you know anyone who's faint of heart right now? Encourage them. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So this church in Thessalonica, clearly they were already encouraging. And Paul comes along and says, good job. Keep encouraging. Encourage more. You know, if we looked at the New Testament letters, the word encouragement is used almost 80 times. You'll be relieved to know this morning that I'm not going to be looking at all 80 of those instances, but I am going to zero in on one Bible character, and we're going to take a quick look at his life. His story is chronicled mostly in the book of Acts, and while you know him as Barnabas, it wasn't his given name. His given name was Joseph, and it was the apostles who changed his name because they realized and witnessed the spiritual gift of God on his life. So they changed his name from Joseph to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Let me tell you his story. Barnabas was a Jew who joined the early church in Jerusalem soon after Christ's crucifixion. The church was growing so quickly, just like this one. And so to assist in the needs there, Barnabas sold a plot of land and he gave that money to the apostles so they could do whatever they needed to meet the, church, meet the needs of that growing church. Acts tells us that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and he gave himself to encourage those new Jerusalem believers to grow in their faith. At this same time, Saul, the former persecutor of the church, arrives in Jerusalem. People there didn't want anything to do with him. They were afraid of him because of who he used to be, because of his history. But Barnabas, the son of encouragement, brought Saul to the apostles, and he gave witness to them about what God was doing in Saul's life. Barnabas was the bridge that Saul needed to move forward in his calling when Saul desperately needed encouragement and friendship, Barnabas was there. It was Barnabas who first recognized that God had chosen Paul for a sacred purpose. Well, the gospel began to spread, so the apostles sent Barnabas to Antioch. There was a large group of Gentiles now that were getting saved, and the apostles wanted to know that everything was unfolding in a way that was God-honoring, so they sent Barnabas. Barnabas heads off to Antioch to see what's happening, and the Bible says when he got there and saw what God was doing among them, like here, he was full of joy. And he again began to pour himself into those new believers. When the people of Antioch needed faith-building reassurance, Barnabas was there. He and Paul worked together in Antioch for over a year, teaching and encouraging large crowds of people because so many people and Gentiles, if you can believe it, like us, they were coming to faith. Then Barnabas and Paul are commissioned on their very first missionary journey. The apostles are saying, wow, we need to get this gospel into different parts of the world, so we're going to send you on a journey. And on that journey, they took a young man named John Mark. For reasons that we don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, John Mark, halfway in that missionary journey, he deserted them. Two years later, on their, secondary, on their second missionary journey, Barnabas went to Paul and said, I really want to take John Mark again. And Paul vehemently disagreed. No, we're not taking him. So they divide. They go separate ways. Paul ends up traveling with Silas in one area of the country. And Barnabas takes John Mark. And they go the opposite way. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, gives John Mark a second chance after a dismal failure. He comes alongside this young man who had failed with encouragement, comfort, and exhortation. And in the years to come, Paul and John Mark will reconcile. 
Mark will become a valued companion of Paul, Barnabas, and Peter, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and Mark will be one of the first to write the teachings and the life of Jesus in his gospel, Mark. When you read the book of Mark, this is who Mark is. This is where Mark started. A fail, he failed, and yet Barnabas came along with encouragement. Barnabas played a major role in the making of who John Mark was to become. Barnabas played a major role in the making of who the apostle Paul was to become. Barnabas likely had many gifts, but his spiritual gift of encouragement appears to be his dominant one. He was one of the most quietly influential people in the early days of Christianity, the son of encouragement. Let us never downplay this gift. It changes people's lives. It saves people's lives. Well, after looking at the life of Barnabas, you may say, well, you know, I kind of thought I might have the gift of encouragement. But now after looking at Barnabas, I'm kind of wondering, I'm, I'm not so sure because I haven't sold any property and given it to the church, and I'm still not sure I'm inclined to do that. And, and I haven't uh, come alongside people like John Mark and Paul like Barnabas did. So I kind of thought I had the gift, but maybe I don't have the gift. Let me say two things in response to that. The gift of encouragement will sound, look, and show itself differently based on who's using it and where God has positioned them. It's impossible to preach a message on the gift of encouragement and not think of my husband, Marshall, think of his dad, Jack. Jack turned 90 in January, and his entire life has been given to encouraging others. He was and still is at 90 a successful businessman who God has used to encourage his employees, budding entrepreneurs, pastors, missionaries, and those he loved the most, his family. His gift was used quietly and often behind the scenes over a coffee or in a staff room. If I were sharing this in Jack's home church this morning, it would be no surprise to me if people jumped up and applauded because, well, Jack's gift looked and sounded different than Barnabas's, it has been no less impactful. And your gift of encouragement will look different than Jack's, and it will look different than the person sitting ahead of you. But friends, it's supposed to look different. And secondly, we are reading the story of Barnabas looking back. So this is after he'd lived a whole life and had grown this gift. I think it's fair to say that Barnabas's gift of encouragement didn't look like this from the very beginning. He had to grow it just like we have to grow it. And maybe, just maybe, Barnabas's gift of encouragement started out by him whispering to the apostle Peter, I really like your sandals. Or turning to Saul, who had Roman citizenship, and saying, that toga looks awesome on you. This past spring, Proverbs 10, 21 jumped out at me. The words of the godly encourage many. And I thought, well, after thinking about it and meditating on it and praying through this verse, it was like it had apprehended me. That's what the word of God does. does. It reaches out and it grabs hold of you. And that's what this verse did. And I thought, well, if this is what I'm supposed to do, then I guess I need to put it on my list, as in my to-do list. Now, that doesn't sound all that godly, does it? Because if you have the gift of encouragement, shouldn't it just kind of flow out of your life? <laughs> apparently for some, but apparently not for me. I had to put it on my list of things to do. But I decided that every day I would encourage someone. And I'd love to tell you that I haven't missed a day since the spring, but that would be a lie. But this is still my plan, and it's still on my to-do list every day to keep my eyes open for people who need encouragement or a kind word. So it might be sending a text to someone to tell them I've been praying for them 
or might be picking up the phone or connecting with a neighbor who is struggling to let them know they're not alone. It might be telling the checkout girl at Sobe, she has the prettiest smile you've ever seen. Or the tech at the lab drawing your blood. They're so good at their job. Do you have any idea how good you are at that job? Or telling an employee that you see the extra effort they're putting in and you're so thankful that they're part of your team. And here's the thing, folks. We can downplay these kinds of interactions, but this is where growing a gift of faith starts because it opens your heart to others and it opens their heart to you. This popped up in my Facebook memories this week from 13 years ago. I wrote, always encourage you never know how close someone might be to giving up, giving in, or being convinced of another's criticism. Christine Kane says, never underestimate the power of encouragement Everyone has tough days or tough seasons, and more often than not, we have no clue what people are going through. We have no clue what people are going through. One kind word. One kind word. One prophetic word. An affirmation of someone's calling or gift or talent can be the difference between them making it or not making it. Friends, whether you have a gift of encouragement or not, whether you think you do or not, there is always someone in your circle that needs encouragement. This morning, I want to circle all the way back to the beginning. I want to finish the story of Garrett and the Geese. That sounds like a book, doesn't it? Garrett and the geese. Maybe I need to write a children's book. On our last school day with the grandkids, Marshall had pulled the car out of the garage and he was waiting for Adley. But it was Friday, so it was uh, not a school day for Garrett. He goes to kindergarten. And so Adley was ready to get in the car and I was standing with Garrett in the doorway that leads from the garage into the house. And just before Adley was getting in the car, I I called out to her and I said, Adley, I hope you have a great day. I'm going to be praying for you because I know you have the spelling test. And she just gave me a little wave. And just before she dipped her head in to get in the vehicle, Garrett, five-year-old Garrett, yelled out, Adley. And she turned and she looked at him and he said, Honk, honk, Adley, honk, honk. And a beautiful smile came over her face. And I looked down at that sweet little boy, and he was looking up at me with these big, beautiful blue eyes, huge smile on his face. And I thought, there you have it, a little five-year-old growing in a gift of encouragement. Can I encourage you? Be like Garrett. Be like Garrett. You have no idea how God may use you. Today, the message has been about encouraging you to encourage others, and that's good, and that's important, but I'm keenly aware that there are some of you here this morning that have a desperate need for a little bit of encouragement yourself. Dan Rather, a CBS News anchor, writes, he has always been fascinated by the sport of boxing. He has carried the words of as high school boxing coach for decades, over and over and over, those coaches would repeat, you must be a get-up fighter. You must be a get-up fighter. If you're in the ring, ring just once in your life and you get knocked down, but you get back up, it's a never-to-be-forgotten experience. And sometimes the only thing making you get up again is someone in your corner pounding the mat and yelling, get back up. I don't know where you are in the audience this morning. If you're here or you're online, you're at Seton. I don't know the challenges that you face, but for all of you that are feeling discouraged, overwhelmed, and defeated, I'm in your corner this morning. I'm in your corner this morning. And not just me, but scores of others that are sitting around you. 
and we're pounding the mat and we're yelling, God loves you. Get back up. God's not finished with you. Get back up. Your story isn't over. Get back up. He will not fail you. Get back up. stand this morning. I've been so gripped in this series. You know, sometimes you can be in church for so long, you just get used to, oh, it's, it's another series. But this one has got a hold of me again. And I love the admonition of the Apostle Paul who says, stir up the gifts. And I want to tell you, there are seasons and times when the gifts, they just settle in. And yeah, maybe we're gifted in that way, but we fail to use them because we get distracted and life gets busy. But this morning, we just want to stir up the gifts. God's given them to you for a reason. And it, it can, they can be, cha they change lives, not just your life, but lives around you. So whatever that gift is, I want to encourage you to eagerly desire it, to go after it, run after God and the gifts become, it'll, it'll spark something new in your life. So this morning, why don't you just put your hand on your heart. If you feel comfortable, just raise your hands. And so Lord, I just stand this morning and I just prophetically stir up the gifts. I look out at your sons and daughters and the influence that sits right here this morning. And God, we know that when we move in the gifts, things change, we change. And so I ask now, God, we stir them up. We stir them up, God, in ways they've never known before, experienced before. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray for an unleashing of the power of this gift of encouragement in this body of believers this morning. May it inspire those who are struggling to keep pressing on despite the challenges. I pray for a culture of encouragement to be woven into the very fabric of First Assembly. And I pray that us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, equipped by the gifts, will now go in and make a kingdom difference in all the places where you've positioned us. We ask it for your name, in your glory, and your honor. Amen.